The short time Fourier transform and the spectrogram are used to analyze the frequency content of signals when that frequency content varies with time. So let's suppose I have a signal as illustrated here and you can see that the frequency content of this signal is varying with time. In this initial interval here, it's relatively low frequency, and then here it's a higher frequency, and then it drops to low again, and then higher even yet, and then low. And signals that have varying spectral characteristics occur commonly in speech and music, seismology. You can look at signals from the electrical activity in the brain and so on. There's a lot of cases where we want to understand how the energy in the signal is changing over time and frequency. Well, we know how to use the DFT to evaluate the frequency content of a signal, and so this suggests a straightforward extension where we simply take segments of the signal, window those out from the rest of the signal, and apply a DFT to each segment and then slide this window along or move to the next segment and then move to the next segment and move to the next segment and each of those segments we're going to do the DFT to find the spectral content of that segment. We can display the DFT coefficients as a function of both time and frequency on two axes and then we'll understand or get insight into the nature of the time varying spectral characteristics of the signal. Now it turns out that for notation reasons, rather than sliding the window through a fixed data record, it turns out that it's easier to fix the window and slide the data past the window. So that's the way we're going to actually do this. So I'm going to have a signal x of n plus m, where m is the dependent variable and n represents the shift of that signal. So the, what occurs at time zero in this signal x of n plus m is the value of x at time n. So if I multiply this by a window w of m, I'm going to extract these values down here, which span from x of n up through x of l minus 1. And we're going to take those values and we're going to use those in a discrete time Fourier transform, as indicated here, so we're going to let value n be the location in time that tells us where we're looking in the time signal. Then we'll introduce a variable lambda, which represents frequency, and we'll just take the discrete time Fourier transform of this product, x of n plus m times w of m. And I've written that out here. Now the notation here is interesting because n is a discrete valued quantity, so I'm using a square bracket on the left hand side and then lambda at this point is continuous so we'll have a parenthesis to indicate a continuous variable. We're going to sample the DTFT like we've done before so we'll evaluate at frequencies lambda k which are 2 pi over n times k and this implies we're using a length n discrete Fourier transform and we'll assume that n is bigger than the duration of the window in general. So that gives us what we call the short time Fourier transform. X of n comma k, so this is at reference time n, and frequency k is the DFT of x of n plus m times a window w of m. So clearly this involves x of n, x of n plus 1, x of n plus l minus 1. So by changing n, we're changing the segment of the data that we're looking at. And the spectrogram, then, is defined as the magnitude squared of the short time Fourier transform. The short time Fourier transform is invertible, and I've written the expression for the inverse short time Fourier transform here. Once you compute a spectrogram, though, you're taking a magnitude squared, which means you're throwing away phase or sign information, and that is not invertible. But if we stick with the short time Fourier transform, we can recover the time signal from the short time Fourier transform. We're going to look at an example here, which is from a saxophone playing a little riff, and the data was recorded at a 44,100 kilohertz sampling rate. In computing the short time Fourier transform and the corresponding spectrogram, we're going to use L equals 812 points per segment. We're going to take a DFT that's of length 2048, so that gives us 2048 frequency samples. And then each of the segments is going to overlap by 192 points. 
Now before we play the riff, let's look at the spectrogram and see if we can make any predictions about what the riff would sound like. Recall that musical instrument is going to have a fundamental frequency, which represents the tone of the note, and then there's going to be various harmonics at multiples of that fundamental frequency that give the instrument its color and its unique sound. So if we look at just the fundamentals here, we can see that riff should start out with a series of increasing pitch notes before it then starts to drop, and we get to this interval here, it's over a second long, where the frequency of the note should stay constant, but the amplitude is going to go in and out, so it gets weaker and stronger. And then we've got a drop here in pitch again, a lower note, and then we end up at an even lower one. So we're going to play this sound now while we look at this spectrogram. <laughs> Let's try to follow along. We'll play that again and I'll see if I can keep my cursor up with the notes of the, the song. So you can see that the spectrogram captures the fundamental properties of that that song in terms of the notes that are being played, their relative amplitudes, and so on. And it's clearly time varying. If we took an overall Fourier transform of the entire seven second segment here, everything would be blurred together and we wouldn't really be able to see these details that we're able to see by breaking things up in time. Now the length of the segment, capital L, trades the temporal resolution for frequency resolution. As L increases, we're using a longer section of time and the segment length increases and consequently we're not able to see details that change in time as well. But as the segment length increases, we get better resolution in the frequency domain. And we can illustrate that with another example here where I've taken three sinusoids and the first one that we've got in this data is a linear chirp that starts at zero and then ends up two seconds later at 300 hertz. And you can see the evidence for this linear chirp here is this slanted line in the spectrogram of the signal. Then we've got another sinusoid, number one, which is constant in frequency for the entire interval at 275 hertz. So that's this spectral line that you see here that runs through the whole interval. And then we took another sinusoid at 300 hertz for the first second and then had it switch instantaneously to 250 hertz for the second second. And this data was simulated as if the sampling frequency was a thousand hertz. So you can see that we're going along with the second sinusoid. It's very clear that it's at 300 hertz. And then there's this big blurry smeared out mess here that occurs at one second. And then out of that, we see later it emerges as showing up at 250 hertz. And this is with a 256 point window. If we decrease the length of the window to 128 points, what happens is our ability to resolve frequencies degrades. So along the vertical axis here, we see that we have less resolution. It's almost difficult to tell that there's two sinusoids at 300 and 275, and then later at 275 and 250. But the temporal resolution is improved by almost a factor of two because we can see that this transition region where we've jumped from a 300 hertz sinusoid to a 250 hertz sinusoid, we can identify the transition time onset. We can identify the moment at which there was a transition much more precisely. The blurring, the temporal blurring associated with this interval is smaller here than that associated with the transition in this case where we had a 256 point window. Now if we look at a sampling frequency of about 1000 Hz, then a 256 point window is roughly a quarter of a second. And you see that indeed for about a quarter of a second here we have this temporal blurring associated with the transition. Where the 128 point window is a little more than a tenth of a second and consequently the blurring that we see in time is reduced at the expense of the increased blurring that we have in frequency. So there's no free lunch here. 
in that we can't obtain arbitrary resolution in both time and frequency. And if you've studied Fourier analysis before, you know that that follows as a consequence of the uncertainty theorem. Well, there's a useful way to think about the time frequency analysis or spectrogram that we're performing here, and it can be interpreted in terms of a bank of filters. So if I take a time domain signal into a filter, say H0, that's a narrow band filter, then the output here will be a function of time. Let's call it Y0 of N. And now if this filter is a narrow band filter centered on, let's say, zero, then this is a narrow band signal whose dominant frequency is near zero. And if I look at the magnitude squared of this, I'm actually going to get the spectrogram evaluated at frequency zero. And as this signal changes over time, the power is going to change over time, and that's going to give me my changing power over time at this particular frequency. And the same thing can happen then at other frequencies. So here we have the first frequency, k equals 1, and this is a filter which passes frequencies corresponding to that, k equals 1, and is narrow band so that the form the magnitude squared of the output and we get the spectrogram at the second frequency as a function of time and so on if we have finally the last frequency that we're interested in a narrow band filter centered there and we take the magnitude squared of that we get the spectrogram at that particular frequency We've got some examples of filter banks here for the chirp and time varying sinusoid that we looked at on the previous slide. And what I'm showing up here are the frequency responses of the filter banks that are used in this particular spectrogram when L is equal to 128 in the top panel and L equals 256 in the bottom panel. Now I'm only showing the first four because otherwise this gets quite busy. And you can see that the first one is centered on frequency of zero and that the second one moves over by two pi over n. And then the next one moves over by another two pi over n and so on. And with L equals 128, we have a certain width or band width for each of these filters. And when L is equal to 256, the bandwidth shrinks in half as we saw in our example. Now the time resolution interpreted in terms of this filter bank has to do with the duration of the impulse response because it's going to be difficult to see transitions in X of N that are significantly shorter than the effective duration of the impulse response. So as L increases, we have narrower bandwidth. What happens in the time domain is the impulse response duration increases and consequently we get reduced temporal resolution.